BYD's next-gen blade battery is about to enter mass production and it could reshape everything from range to safety, price as well. So the Gen 2 blade battery officially is ready. So BYD has been testing it, refining it, according to multiple sources, and they're just weeks away from mass production. So what we were told last year is that it was going to be August this year, and uh, as of today, it's the 1st of August, so that's pretty nice. This new battery, it's not a mild update. What we're talking about is a proper leap forward, 30% higher density, uh, better efficiency, smaller packaging, uh, even lower cost stature, which is really good. So all of those things create a brilliant package. In this video, I want to break down all that we know about the Gen 2 blade battery, how it compares to the original blade battery or the original two blade batteries. Nobody talks about the first one, which was, I kind of dub it the Gen Zero battery. And uh, why this could seriously shift the market, the electric vehicle market. Hello folks, my name is Ben Alexander. Thank you so much for joining it, joining and, and for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. Thank you as well to all of the supporters on uh, Patreon and YouTube members, even the ones on the free tier, like I always say. It really makes it possible for me to keep on doing these videos and put the time aside to make them. And it does take uh, a lot of time every day to make them. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Let's start with the main specs. What exactly has changed? According to BYD, uh, and reports from Chinese media as well, energy density has gone from 150 watt hours per kilogram to 210 watt hours per kilogram. So that's a 30 odd percent increase. Cost is now 15% less compared to the generation one version. Uh, the new structure is more compact and that allows uh, more battery in less space effectively. So that's the net gain. It's still LFP chemistry, lithium ion phosphate, but with better layering, more advanced electrolyte control. And safety is actually improved despite the increase in density, which you would think would be to the contrary of that. Uh, we're talking about better thermal stability and more intelligent pack management. So that's a really big deal because typically when you push up the energy density, uh, you lose safety and particularly with LFP chemistry we've we've pretty much pushed it as far as we can really push it unless something really really changes and uh, there's a big breakthrough and I'm not aware of any of those. They've kept the core advantage of LFP chemistry, low volatility and it's just made it you know they've made it more efficient uh, and because it's still cell to pack there's no waste space in modules it's really just the cells are butter to each other and it's still a structural battery pack, so it becomes part, part of the car's frame, but smaller and just more energy dense and also a little bit cheaper, 15% cheaper or so to produce the battery. So maybe they will pass that saving on to us, the consumers. Here's where it gets really useful for you and me as the, the, the consumers, really, I suppose. The original Blade battery gave cars like the Atto 3 and the Dolphin about 400-ish, 430, 440, 450, if you're, if, you're, if you're lucky, uh, WLTP kilometer range using a 60.48 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now with the Gen 2, a similar sized battery could push that up well past 500 WLTP. That's without switching to NMC or nickel based chemistries. How does this stack up against Tesla's 4680 cells or CATL's Keelin battery? Tesla's 4680 is impressive uh, in structural terms anyway. And it has higher gravimetric energy density due to NMC, but it's also more flammable and uh, has heat management issues under stress. So when, once you're charging it back to back to back or you're really driving around California on a hot day, for example. CATL's Keelin battery is a strong rival. That's like, that's the big one outside of Tesla, outside of BYD, it's the CATL Keelin battery. It uses cell to pack as well and it pushes the gravimetric density over 200 watt hour per kilogram, but it's expensive and still largely focused on NMC chemistries. BYD's advantage is cost control. They make their own battery cells, build their own packs, and now with the Gen 2 version, they've got a battery that uh, that's closing the energy gap with NMC and LFP chemistry uh, battery cells. Uh, but it's also cheaper and safer. So if you're a fleet buyer, a government agency, or you, you own some buses, I'm sure lots of you own a few buses, and uh, yeah, or if you're a regular driver looking for value and you don't really want the range to drop off, LFP chemistry is really, really good. 
because after a thousand or two thousand cycles you should still have pretty much all of your capacity there or most of it if you're looking for value that combination is incredibly compelling and i think that's why a lot of people like lfp chemistry this is going to be going into production uh, any week now really first in china then likely in the new factories in thailand and brazil and soon europe we're expecting hungary or turkey to be producing them expect it to first show up in uh, the new denza and yang wang yang wang models uh, but then it will quickly move into volume cars like the dolphin or the atto 3 or the byd seagull under its many names and uh, that should all be mm, kind of happening by the end of this year and halfway through next year. So this isn't just a small upgrade. It's a really big deal. It's uh, BYD showing that LFP uh, chemistry still has more headroom and that solid state isn't the, the only next generation tech uh, on our horizon, basically. So now let's address something a lot of people ask me about. What about solid state batteries? Isn't that the future? Where are they? It, it is a big deal, but also not yet it's not really here is it uh, solid state batteries are on uh, are exciting on paper but they're not really real yet we can't really go buy a car with them but i think the truth is no one is mass producing them at scale in 2025 or 2026 toyota say 2027 however there is a screenshot which I, i'm not sure i'll be able to find but it was all all of the tweets that tesla have been saying that uh, they're coming out with solid state batteries next year and I think it was 2009, 2011 or 12, 2014, 2017. So if they say it's 2027, don't expect 2027. Neo say 2026, so that's definitely, that could happen. QuantumScape is also still uh, years off. So maybe by the turn of the, 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 turn of the decade, basically, 2030. Uh, meanwhile, BYD is delivering 210 watt hour per kilogram batteries in the real world right now with the gen 2 blade battery and that's with uh, lfp not cobalt no nickel no thermal runaway not really so what does this mean first off this massively reduces the urgency for solid state if we've got a good enough battery now it's good enough so we don't need to stress anymore about solid state batteries and if you can build a dolphin or seal that goes 600 kilometers or 700 kilometers on a charge at half the cost do most buyers really care that it isn't solid state? Probably not. I mean, if you look at some of the most sold cars on the planet, like um, a Toyota Yaris, imagine you're English or European right now or Australian. Toyota Yaris, under jazz. How much can you do in a, on a tank of petrol, a little hatchback, really, you know, really reliable little cars over the last 20, 30 years? Six or 700 kilometers. That's kind of it. That's, that's all we really need, obviously, because that's kind of what we're used to and that, that is sufficient for long trips. And uh, yeah, this is key. The Gen 2 blade battery is safe, it's cheap, it's recyclable, doesn't have much in it. And those were the biggest three selling points of solid state batteries. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, BYD is also uh, still working on solid state batteries and uh, they've registered patents for semi-solid state packs, even hinted at 400 watt hour per kilogram solid state. Uh, BYD Seagull down the line actually so that's pretty nifty they doubled the range uh, per kilogram uh, of uh, of battery capacity for for the BYD Seagull but right now they just don't need it oh, I don't think they need it they've already solved the problem which is range uh, sodium we could talk about sodium that's a very different chemistry and there are some very very serious negatives to sodium but by and large it's pretty cool it's pretty compelling it's very useful and uh, I did a what did I do? I did a poll. If you I put I'll put it on the screen now for you. I did a poll and I simply asked you if you could buy a car now with the same range sodium LFP, what would you pick? And I think seventy or eighty percent of you picked LFP. Most people would pick LFP. And uh, yeah, that's coming as well. But for now, going into cheap short range vehicles, the Gen two blade battery still will dominate that basically and dominate the middle and upper upper end of the EV market. So yes, solid state batteries are coming. The Gen 2 blade battery might buy BYD another three to five years, maybe, of total dominance before it even matters. Some people take issue with 98% of the world's LFP batteries coming from China and 2% not. Let's talk about something that people forget when talking about electric vehicles, where the actual energy comes from. So because that massive, massively affects how uh, clean your EV really, really is, 
So let's compare electric generation in 2024 by region using the latest data from uh, the IEA and Ember. So in Europe, 2024, European Union electricity was 61% fossil free. That includes 22% from wind, 18 from nuclear, 14 from hydro, 7 from solar. Fossil fuels made up about 39% of European Union power. That number is dropping every year. In Denmark and Norway, also Sweden, they are all over 80% clean electricity with Norway, nearly 100% hydro. And um, yeah, I believe that a lot of the the electricity that's produced in Norway is now, it, it has been state owned, but they've been privatizing that, I believe. And then prices have been going up over the last 15 years in Norway. I remember when it was very cheap, 10, 15 years ago in Norway, I remember getting electric bills and it wasn't very expensive at all. And now I'm seeing prices kind of go up, honestly. So if you're driving an EV in Europe, especially in the north, it's likely being charged on low carbon power. And uh, yeah, I really reckon in places like Sweden and Norway, they really should keep it state owned, not sell it off for profit because your the necessity for electricity in Scandinavia uh, should not be something that's, you know, profiteers are trying to to make money on. That's illogical completely. So in the US, fossil fuels still supply 60% of electricity, 38 from natural gas, 18 from coal, and the rest uh, comes from nuclear, which is 20%, 10% wind, 4% solar, 6% hydro. China obviously is just like a complete different category. It's just it's wild what's going on in China. So fossil fuels, 62% of electricity uh, you know, comes from fossil fuels. 58 from coal, 3% natural gas. Other fossil fuels are 1% low carbon sources, uh, low carbon sources, whatever they may be, 38%, hydro 13, wind 10, solar 8, nuclear 4, bio 2. So just to give you an example of what's happening in the energy grid in on the side of things in China, and to highlight just how much the world's largest grids are actually altering at the minute, last year, the USA added 50 gigawatts of solar to the grid. China added 96 gigawatts to the grid last month. The USA is currently building two nuclear reactors. China is currently building 27 nuclear reactors. Every 18 months, China adds an entire United States grid worth of electric uh, of generation capacity, coal and natural gas mainly. 98% uh, of global LFP batteries are made in China. So these are all verifiable numbers, not inaccurate, not made up. They're absolutely correct. So what is fascinating is that BYD manufactures a lot of its own batteries in regions of China with higher hydro power availability. So I guess it's also just more reliable, such as Chongqing or Sichuan, I think you say. They're shifting more production to cleaner grids in Thailand and Brazil as well. So if you're exporting an EV made in China and charging it in Norway, the whole life cycle emissions could be lower than an ICE car in the UK by over 70%. So that's according to transport and environment from the European Union. So here's a question for you. If BYD can now offer 500 kilometers plus range using LFP chemistry with better cost and safety. Do you really care about NMC chemistry or solid state chemistry? How much? Because it, it seems to eradicate the necessity for them, in my opinion. Or is this enough to push EV adoption even faster? I think it probably is. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you like uh, the videos, you're very welcome to support them uh, on Patreon, YouTube members, or subscribe, which is also very useful. It makes my channel grow on YouTube and uh, you, it costs you nothing and, and you get my videos for free. So that's lovely. Any questions, just put them in the comments below. I will read them and I'll respond to them if you want me to. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching.